Hello, my name is Ryan from Buster Beagle 3D. And today I'm gonna to go over a couple of changes that I made to the original MK3 injection molding machine. Now, these changes are really to upgrade the clamping abilities, some of just the general safety features, as well as ease of use by adding some electronics that not only make it easier, but they also add a, a bit of consistency to the machine. So what are all these changes and how did I do them? Well, let's find out. But first, what do Ryan Reynolds and I have in common other than our name? Literally nothing. Other than the fact that I've now partnered with Mint Mobile for today's video. Now, before you skip ahead, hear me out for just a second. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at $15 a month on the nation's largest 5G network. My breakfast just costs more than that. All plans include unlimited nationwide talk and text, plus lightning fast 5G and a free mobile hotspot. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, that's way cheaper than my plan, but I don't wanna go through the hassle of switching just to try it out. And I'm telling you that it's no hassle at all, and you can be up and running in about 15 minutes and don't even have to cancel your current plan to try it out. Do what I did. And yes, I've been using Mint Mobile for a few months now. Try it out, I was able to use a digital eSIM that activates immediately on my phone. Do I have a brand new phone? No, it's an almost three-year-old iPhone, but still compatible with digital eSIMs. When signing up, I said that I wanted a new number so I could test the service without transferring my old number. That way I was able to have both my current carrier and Mint Mobile on the same phone, and I could choose between them while using it to compare the services between the two. If your phone is not compatible with a digital eSIM, then Mint will ship you a SIM card for free. After I was happy with the service, and since there are no long contracts, I was able to just re-sign up for the service, but this time I took my old number with me, making the transition seamless. And now for a special limited time offer, you can get their unlimited plan, which is normally $30 a month, for just $15 a month for three months. Be sure to use my URL, trymintmobile.com slash busterbeagle, or click the link in the description to let them know I sent you. It really helps out the channel, and thank you to Mint Mobile for partnering with me on this video. Okay, so the first thing that you'll notice about this machine, and something that kind of spurred all these changes, is the vise that I added to this machine. Now, this is called a Heinrich uh, DA6601 vise. Uh, I picked this particular one up off of eBay for pretty cheap. I, I believe these run around the $17 to $2,000 range, and I picked this one up on eBay for about $400, so... It was quite a steal, and it, it fits perfectly inside of the frame of the MK3. Now, the strength of this particular vise, it can take up to 120 max PSI, and that'll generate about 2,200 pounds of pressure in this particular vise. Now, all of this is run off of the pneumatics the same way that the cylinder on the top would, so I have one line in, I have two regulators that send different amounts of pressure to each component. So right here I have the vise itself taking about 110 PSI, whereas on the particular mold that I'm working on right now, it only has 40 PSI going to the pressure of the cylinder itself. Now, another change in this particular system is that both of these regulators are now controlling electronic pneumatic buttons. Now, on the original MK3, we had these pneumatic switches, and you just press the button, it'll take the air that comes in, and it will send the air to the, the cylinder. So now, instead of having a manual switch that I press, I have two electronic switches. So the first one is here on the side, and this is controlling the air going to the cylinder and I have another button on the other side, and this one is controlling the air that is going to the pneumatic vise. Now, the way I control these electronic switches is through this button system over here. Now, this is getting power from the power that was going to the original PID controller. I'm just running power to this. 
And the vice is controlled by what's called a latch button switch. So what this does is when I press the button in, you'll see that it lights up and it's sending a signal to this back switch telling it to send air to the vise. Now it's not doing anything right now because I don't have any air hooked up to this machine. But for as long as that button is, is pressed in, the vise will have clamped and it'll stay there until I press the button again and the vise will retract and give me my part. Now right above that is what is called a momentary switch. And this momentary switch controls this back valve. And when I press the button, it'll light up and, and trigger that switch, which will drop the piston into the chamber. Now, it will only do that when I'm pressing the button. And for however long I press the button, as soon as I let go, uh, it'll retract and the, the air will, will come out. Now, the reason I have this button here is really just for kind of testing purposes or if I put some pellets in my chamber and I want to tamp them down I can use this to kind of tap those pellets down but really the way that I want to use this machine now and to kind of keep up with the consistency is I have this relay timer over here and the way that this works is it still sends a signal to that same valve that this button is sending a signal to, but this can be timed. So what happens is when I press this button, you'll see a countdown here going from, in this instance, 10 seconds, all the way down to zero. And then when it's done, it'll just let go and it'll turn that light off and it'll let go of the valve and the piston will go up. So that's just another way of making sure that there is more of a consistency in the amount of time that the piston is working to get kind of more consistent parts. Now, another kind of just obvious change to the way that this machine is set up currently is this plexiglass shield that I now have around the entire machine. Now, these are just quarter inch plexiglass that I designed and I cut out on my CO2 machine. Uh, I have a door with a magnet on it and a piece of metal on the side that that magnet just connects to to keep the door closed. The magnet on this is actually from one of those Harbor Freight flashlights. In the back, there is a, a really, really small magnet behind this metal piece. I just took that out, glued it on there, and that's what is keeping this door closed. And then I 3D printed a little bit of a handle and then used these self-adhesive acrylic hinges to be able to put the door on the frame. Now, the way that this is kind of sitting in here is this front piece is sitting on the vise itself. I added two other aluminum extrusion parts to the side here so that the other sections can kind of sit inside of them. And then in the back, the back is screwed into the aluminum extrusion itself. And then I have a fan duct that attaches to the inside of this and then has some tubing and now this tubing is what i connect to a a much larger air exhaust system that i have and really it's, it's what i use on my laser engravers and it does a really good job of sucking all of the fumes from the plastic injection out of my work area which is really really nice and then the top here is just another piece of plexiglass that's just sitting on the top and I cut the holes that are needed for the rods and for the piston so that they won't interfere going in and out. So it's pretty much enclosed all around. It's open in the back here and it's open on the bottom. But since most of the fumes are coming up and I have a pretty strong air intake fan, it does a really good job of getting a lot of those fumes out of my work area. Now, the last thing about this enclosure is most of it was put on after the machine was already assembled, except for the top piece. The, the top part has to be put on before you put on the rods and you put on all of the chamber components. But the rest of it was kind of slid into place. And the way that I did that was these parts 
are just bigger than the distance between these aluminum extrusions. And the reason I did that was, you know, if I'm working on this and, and something happens or there's an issue with something, I want to be able to access inside of here fairly quickly. And so, again, this is just larger than the aluminum extrusion gap so that I can take this, pull it to the side, and then pull this entire door off. And so then I could come in here, I could do whatever I need to do, clean up whatever I need to clean up or, you know, assess any type of emergency. And then when it's done, I can just put it back in, put it in the slot, lift it up, push it over, and then it kind of just seats into place. And this is not coming out. You, you have to really try to take it out, but, it, but it's a nice way of, of kind of keeping all of this stuff really contain like if you know if there was anything going to be like splashing plastic if there was an error of some kind it's really kind of a, a nice safety feature that provides that uh, amount of safety and the fume extraction so now another little change that i have here that you might notice is that you can see that there's another pid controller on the bottom here and what this pid controller is doing is is heating my molds up now with this very large vise that I have, the problem is it's this huge piece of iron and it essentially acts as a heat sink for my molds. So there's no way to really go in here unless I'm using a torch or a heat gun to heat my molds initially. Uh, but even if I do that, the coolness of the vise itself uh, can can lower the temperature of my mold and the last thing you want to do is shoot the hot plastic into a cold mold because then it will solidify immediately and then you won't be able to complete the shot. So what I did was I have this PID controller on the side over here and that's controlling these, these heaters that I have inserted into my mold. So it's just these, these little rods and these little rods are controlled by this. And I don't know what the max temp of this is, but really I only ever set my molds to around 40 degrees Celsius. And that's enough to, to keep it warm, but not too hot that it's, you know, doing any type of melting. And they just insert right in the side of my molds. And I have one on both sides of the molds on, on the front face and on the back face. And then over on the side over here, I have my thermocouple in the front part of the mold, keeping track of the temperature so that it, it will stop at a certain point and, and not heat it up anymore. And then, you know, when you do enough rounds and there's enough plastic injecting in there, those heaters won't really turn on because the, the mold is already hot enough. Now, the last kind of little change, and it's, it's something that's a little bit more experimental, and I haven't used it just yet, but it's something that I that I plan on playing with a little bit in the future, is this little device you see here on the side. And what this is, is a vacuum. And it is a vacuum that runs off of air pressure. So when air pressure goes inside of this little device, it will create a suction out of the other port over here. And the idea behind it is when you're injecting plastic into your molds, the plastic goes in and it has to push all of the air that is trapped inside of the mold out of the mold. Now, if you're doing stuff with more intricate pieces, uh, you really want to make sure that there's, there's a way for that air to escape. Now, what you can also do, and I believe what some more professional machines do from time to time, is they, they have suction so they basically create a vacuum inside of the mold before it injects so that you're not pushing any air out. You're just filling the vacuum with the plastic. So that's kind of the idea behind this is when, when I have a, a mold where I want to try something a little bit fancier, uh, I'm going to see if I could hook up a vacuum to the mold so that when I inject, I don't have to worry about those air vents anymore because there will be a vacuum inside of that mold. So that's what that is. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to go over a little bit of the mold design that I have here. 
And that mold design is to create, again, a, a semi-automatic uh, injection molding machine. So what it'll do is it'll create the part and then it'll eject the part. And I'll, and I'll show you how I set up that mold now. Okay, so I thought I'd go over this in 3D to kind of give you a better understanding of what's going on here. So this is the CAD for the section that is entered into the mold vise. And so on the left here, we have the sections that are going to be moving back and forth with the vise. Uh, it contains the, the whole section here that is going to have the ejector pins that are going to remove the part from the mold. And then on the right here, we have the part that's going to stay static for the most part, except for this little anti-drool plate that's going to come back and forth to go under the chamber to make sure that between shots, we don't have any, any drooling from the chamber itself. And as far as the mold and kind of pin design is concerned, I actually got a lot of the ideas from this from the John SL YouTube channel. He has a pretty cool video where he goes over his semi-automatic projector pin design. Uh, so definitely go over and check out his channel to kind of see where uh, I got a lot of the uh, inspiration for what I was doing with this particular mold. Okay, so here you can see the pieces integrated into the vise itself. And I'll kind of go over what each of the pieces is doing. You can also see where the chamber will sit above. Uh, I don't have the rest of the frame in here, but this is really just to kind of go over what the mold is doing. So right in the front, we have the two mold pieces, and these are just kind of bolted onto the back plates here. And this is what you see in that video where I use my fiber laser to cut out the coin molds for the last video. And so I had these, I had all of these components CNC'd for me. I actually did it through PCB way. So I just sent them all the CAD files that I was showing you in the last step. And, and they sent me all of these mold pieces back. And I've made this in such a way that if I wanted to switch out this mold, I don't have to switch out every one of these components. I can kind of just, you know, take these pieces and remove them. And then that way add, add some other pieces to this. So on the section that has the movable slide, I also have a back plate here. And this is just a back plate that is helping to kind of hold the pins that are going to be coming through and pushing to the other side. And I'll, I'll go deeper into that in just a moment. And then behind that, I have all of the ejector pins and some of the pins that are being used to put push the ejector pins back into the mold. As you can see, some of the pins are longer than the others. So the ones that are shorter are going to be used for the ejector pins. And the ones that are longer are going to push up against the other side of the mold and retract this entire piece. Behind that, I have another plate that these pins are going to insert into. And then behind that, I have a back plate that is going to basically make it so that the pins can go back any further. And then... Right here, I have these dowels, and these dowels go through the other components. So if you were looking at it from the top, they go through these, these two middle plates, and they press right up against the back of this other back plate. And the reason that I did that was when this vise closes, I don't want all of the pressure from the mold to only be on these kind of two spacer sections over here. And so really all of these, these dowels do that go through this section that pushes the pins is it just butts up against this back plate and then also butts up against this front plate. And what that is intended to do is to just make sure that when this vice is being pressed together, it's keeping the pressure right here on the top and on the bottom so that I'm not getting any bowing in the metal when these two parts are pushed together. 
And then I have these two plates, one on the top and one on the bottom. And what these are going to do is when this whole play retracts, it's going to hit this back plate over here and it's going to push the pins forward and that'll push these pins forward and eject the part. This will all make a little bit more sense in a second, but that's the general overall pieces of the part of the slide. And then on the other side over here, I just have a back plate that is what is, is hooks up the mold to the vise. So on both sides over here, both of these components are what attach to the vise itself. So instead of using the jaws that are normally on the vise, basically I took the, the whole position of where those jaws attach to the vise, and that's what's attaching my mold. So these three holes on the top here and the three holes on the top over here, they are what are holding this entire apparatus to the, to the vise itself. Now, when I was getting these CNC'd and created, I have this one on the side that needs the slot in the bottom for the pin injection slide. And on this side, I didn't need that. But when I was having them made, I just had them make two of these so that you didn't have to pay for the setup because sometimes it's cheaper to get multiple parts made that are the same rather than a one-off and another one-off. So I never had this part made over here. I just had two of these parts made and it, and it worked perfectly for both sides. Okay. So, and then on the other side over here, I also have this anti-drool plate. And so what happens is, is when this plate moves forward, this screw that I have in here is going to hit this plate and then it's going to pull, pull this back with tension on this spring. And that is going to expose the, the screw over here. Okay. So to kind of see this all in action, what will happen is this plate will move forward. When it does, this screw is going to hit this anti-drool plate and it's going to push it back. And then the other thing that you're going to see is that these pins that are protruding out here are protruding out further than the ejector pins that I have inside of the, the runners here. So you'll see that move forward, push that plate forward. And then when it becomes flush, it will move this entire pin plate back. And so then after that, we have our injection. We'll let it sit for a while and then we'll retract the other side of the mold. So that'll go back. The anti-drool will now tuck under the chamber again. And then as this plate goes all the way back, it's going to hit this back plate of the vise. And when it does, it'll push that entire plate forward and eject the part. And then it'll be ready for the next round. So that's really kind of how this whole thing is set up. Again, this is this is for more of a, a semi-automatic version of the injection molding machine because sometimes the the part will still stick in there and you kind of kind of hit it with your finger or something. But it's it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient than you know closing a mold, putting a C clamp on it, and then putting it under your machine. So this way I can just press the red button on the machine. It'll go forward, push that forward. I will inject, wait until the plastic solidifies, and then it'll go back, eject the part, and be ready for the next round. Now again, I designed all of these parts in CAD, and then I had them milled for me from PCB Way. Now PCB Way is something you might be familiar with for PCB boards, but they also have their own CNC services. So you can have parts milled directly through them. And if I would go back to this Fusion file, I think everything here was around $500 for all of these pieces. Now, when I did these particular molds, I did them in such a way that I knew that I was going to use my fiber laser to cut the coins into them. 
But I mean, I, I could have just as easily done a design and had the entire thing sent to them. Now, all of these holes that are threaded in here are M5 bolts. And one of the things that you can do to kind of reduce the cost of some of the CNC milling of this is to just thread those holes yourself. So I think when I, when I got these pieces, I didn't have them thread them. I just had them cut the holes for me and then I threaded them myself. You know, it's not that much more expensive, I think, to have them do the threading as well. But, you know, and any any cost savings kind of helps when, when doing these large orders. And again, this is made in such a way that I could have a much larger mold on here. This is only kind of utilizing half of the space, but I made it large in, in case I ever wanted to expand it in the future. And then again, I don't have to repurchase any of these parts. All I would have to do is change the mold that's on the front on both sides and swap those out and, and be able to, to make a different mold here. Now that's kind of a, a rundown on some of the new features that I have on this new machine. Again, some of this is really dependent on the vice that you can get for this. So this is not going to really be kind of a new setup for the MK3, at least maybe not initially. I will try to release some parts and some plans on how I did some of this stuff and, and kind of go over what you can do to kind of hook this up yourself. But it is a little bit dependent on having this particular vice. And again, if you can't find one cheap on eBay, it, it's, it, it is more of an expensive vice, but hopefully this gives you some ideas of how you can bring the machine to be kind of a more semi-automatic machine. Also, you know, obviously, if this was sitting on the table right now, there's nowhere for the part to fall out. This machine is usually on a hydraulic jack cart that I got from Harbor Freight so that I can move it around because just this vice that I added to this machine adds about 90 pounds to this overall setup. So it's not something that's real easy to pick up and moved onto tables like this. You either have to have a very dedicated spot for it or the hydraulic uh, cart works really, really well uh, to be able to move these things around. But that's pretty much it. So I hope you guys like this. If you have any questions, please do leave a comment down below and I'll try my best to answer those questions. If you check out the video description, I'll try to put some of the links to some of the parts that I'm using here as well as kind of maybe some diagrams on how I set up some of the wiring for this system. I hope you guys like this. Thanks again for watching. And if you want to see more content like this, please do uh, consider subscribing for more things having to do with injection molding, laser engravers, and all things maker. Thanks again, be safe, and we'll see you next time.